Hello, beautiful souls, and welcome back to Fear It Goes. I am so excited to bring you Christopher Kennedy. He is a phenomenal soul, and I'm so honored to have him on the podcast today. He is going to be sharing with you many ideas that need some reshaping in the world, and with his new book coming out, it couldn't come at a better time. When we are looking for some serious parameters and some serious guidance in how to be the best we can be. So without further ado, welcome to Fear It Goes and our conversation all around the virgin, the beauty, and the bitch. Welcome to Fear It Goes. <laughs> Welcome to Fear It Goes, the podcast all about taking your fears with you and doing it anyway. I'm your host, Brandi Taylor. Welcome, Chris. I'm so excited to have you on Fear It Goes. Um, what an exciting time to be discussing you and what you're working on because your book is just coming out. Yes, I'm very, very, very like overwhelmed really it's, <laughs> it's funny you sit back and you've worked on this thing for so long and there it is like a child in a manger and it's like did i do that <laughs> how did i do that but there it is you actually it's there in the flesh and you can you know relief through it and smell it and touch it and it's a it's, a, it's a, kind of surreal it's funny when i was a filmmaker um, I remember that process just as you describe it. It's so interesting because you start with this idea and then the idea comes out and by the end, you're just like, wow, what happened? This thing is so amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's so incredible. And it kind of takes it takes over and does its own thing yeah. and becomes what it's really, truly meant to be out mm -hmm. in the world. Right. But it's also scary because now you're vulnerable. You're out. Yeah. Right? It's scary, but it's beautiful that vulnerability. I was I don't I don't see vulnerability as a as a negative. Me neither. Oh aspects. Sometimes it can be. However, I I believe it's a power actually. I think it's one of our greatest powers and it shows our greatest strength because it's hard to be vulnerable. It's easy to hide. Mm -hmm. It's hard mm -hmm. to put that out there, whatever that may be. And it's hard not to be authentic when you're vulnerable. Can you actually not, can you be dis or unauthentic or disauthentic when you are in a vulnerable state, when you are being true to whatever you're sharing? Exactly. Exactly. You can. That's why I think it's so powerful. It's funny. I literally was talking to somebody about this like three days ago, a really great guy, a um, friend of mine. And we were talking about like the ability to be able to cry. And how it's been taught for so long that guys don't cry and you shouldn't do this. It's one thing to cry over everything, right? It's another to cry in a moment when it's very appropriate. And you should because you need to release the emotion instead of holding that in. Because honestly, that's really destructive to our bodies. But That mentality is changing. Um, I watch sports. That's where I get my human drama from, not necessarily <laughs> television. Because it's in the moment and it's um, it's real as it's happening, and I see a lot of macho sports men behaviors, yeah, these days. Good of like things that they've accomplished or things that they failed at. It's quite refreshing, and I don't know how the world sees it. I see it as progress. I don't know how the rest of the world <laughs> views these men. Um, considering our past and what we consider to be masculine about men. Okay. So actually, I think that's a really great place for us to start. Um, that is a really great place for us to start is talking about the masculine and feminine, feminine, because that is such a your space thing, <laughs> such a your space thing, which is the premise behind the virgin, the beauty and the bitch. Is it not? It is. So the, the, my podcast is called Virgin Beauty Bitch. 
And then my book is called Virgin Beauty Bitch, Origin of the Man-Made Woman. Interesting. Okay, so let's start from the beginning, because <laughs> you have a very interesting origin story, as, <laughs> as it would so be. Um, and what's driven you into writing this, creating this podcast, creating this book, and creating this movement, because it is a movement. So for me, it actually started consciously. In 2008, I went to a Tony Robbins event in Orlando, Florida, Date with Destiny. Nice. And it was a room, as most Tony's events are, it's just chaotic people from all over the world. It's a beautiful, beautiful carnival of people. Mm -hmm. And over the 10 days I was there for that event, pretty much every day, a woman would stand up in the audience and speak her heart about her life experience and the suffering she was going through. And that's what I heard most was the suffering that all these women shared. I, I call it a communal suffering is how it sort of sunk into me. And over that uh, time, uh, pretty much <laughs> over and over again, Tony would hear what was being said. He would absorb what was being said. And then he would respond in a way that completely shocked me. And he what do you mean? He would look at these women and he would, like I said, empathize with where they're at and what's going on with them. But he would then turn the mirror around and say, look at yourself. You are beautiful. You're smart. You're mm. ambitious. You've got everything going for you, but you're living your life as a man. Interesting. You have lost your feminine. Right. That really resonated with me, not in the moment. However, about a year later is when I got the idea from the heavens above to write a book about the feminine. I had no idea what <laughs> I was getting myself into. <laughs> <laughs> However, the pull and the, the drive to that topic was so strong that nothing was going to stop me from doing that. In fact, 10 years later, I'm still writing that book. However, in, as a pit stop, I started my podcast, Virgin Beauty Bitch as a way of exploring archetypes that I notice have influenced the lives of women and they take for granted, men take for granted. However, mm. they have not really, they've not served women because these archetypes are actually invented by men. Right. Women did not invent these archetypes for themselves. Men placed it on them and that's how they live. So what are these archetypes? So the virgin, purity. Uh chastity right it goes against everything a woman is born to create Be. which is life it basically stops that process until a man is ready for it <laughs> because it's all about the man <laughs> it is all about the man it is all about the man <laughs> right and beauty if i look out into the animal kingdom there is not an animal species on the planet where the, the female has to use beauty as her attraction. Only humans make women do that. That's funny, actually, when you say that, because you think about birds and the males are the ones that are really beautiful and the women or females are the ones that are muted colors. Absolutely. Huh. Look, look Interesting, I had thought of that. In the, in the species around us on the planet Earth, female humans are the only ones responsible for beauty as their attraction. Huh. Beauty and semi-perfection or perfection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's ruined many a life. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the bitch, I mean, it is the ultimate muzzle, the ultimate um, you know, chain that is held by men over women. Right. There's no word in the language of any culture that equates to it for a man as far as being you know denigrating oh i don't know i think there's a few others not like <laughs> not like, as universal as bitch there's nothing mm, there's one that starts with a c that's pretty bad <laughs> no um, i mean for for men there's no equal to denigrate a man ah uh, one word interesting one word denigrates all women from the moment they're born you're born under that brand. right 
and you live with it through your whole life. Hmm. Interesting. And women have done their best to change that image of that word. Right. In fact, you go to a school, any school these days, that, that word is thrown around by the girls more than it is by the guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't think it has the same power or the same meaning that's placed on it as it did even 30, 40 years ago today. There's other words that can contain more charge to them for sure. Um, but it's, it's interesting too, when you look at that archetype, when you look at these as archetypes, cause I had never thought of them really from this pl place. Um, and I see now why you say man created these images and how you should fall into one of, um, but the bitch is a very interesting archetype because it's very masculine driven from a very, um, um, masculine energy standpoint of create by any means necessary, do by any means necessary, drive by any means necessary. And that's not feminine. Feminine considers multiple aspects when it comes to um, how we choose to create mm -hmm. or how we choose to do mm -hmm. and who that's going to affect and how. Whereas masculine energy not always, but often has done this. And that's how we've seen like economies rise. That's how we've seen companies rise. That's how we've seen people move through ranks is I will do whatever it takes, regardless of what that means. Mm -hmm. And women have done this too. I'm just saying that tends to be more of a masculine space. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that, that's how the podcast was born was to explore these archetypes and to speak with, um, I mean, the, the podcast is, is more, is not necessarily about those words. It's about the experience of women in, in life right. Right. and uh, showing um, their experiences in contrast. So it's very obvious. A lot, of, a lot of women are living their lives just to survive life, just to, to get ahead, to move forward. And these, um, these archetypes or these uh, influences they don't even realize drive them forward or guide them through life. And they're not able to shed them because they're not even aware of them. Well, the beauty one, I think, has become very much in the forefront. Dove did that incredible mm -hmm. campaign to really bring this forward and say, hey, 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 this is not okay. Mm -hmm. No one has to be the perfect model. No one has to be the Barbie doll. No one has to be these unrealistic, perfect images and it's funny because even even when we look at the uh, world of modeling these pictures are these pictures are cleaned up these pictures are modified these like and you see the end product and it's half the time it's not even really that shoot it's not a clean shot it's not the perfect shot it's been cleaned up it's been perfected that nose has been slightly altered there's been some shadowing placed here so it, it exemplifies this area or you know what i mean like it's not even real there are now well, there has been for a long time apps where girls can do that own remodeling <laughs> of themselves and present themselves that way as well as perfect as possible because and the because it's still so seed, ingrained the seed has been yeah. planted a long time ago and it's still so ingrained still so ingrained it's fascinating actually i i it's funny that we're talking actually about this. I came across something the other day that was um, an app, not about not about um, altering your picture, but creating the perfect avatar that is you, mm -hmm. right? So same idea almost, like the perfect you. What would you look like? What would you like? What would your hair look like? How perfect could you be? And I'm thinking to myself, oh my god, I don't want anything but me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want to be me and you can love it or not. <laughs> but if you're a young, young girl, young boy, and you want to fit in, you want to be popular. Right. That is your prime focus at that stage of life. You're going to do what is available to you. Isn't this, doesn't that say so much about what we're teaching our kids though? If this is the primary if this is what we need to be, to be popular, to be great, to be accepted by our peers, right? 
I, I have this in the back of my mind. I carry this around. I don't share it very often. But I, it's like to me, your mother is your surrogate and your society is actually your mother. I would agree. That is the one that gives you all your values and the things that you want to strive for. It comes through media. It comes through things that you read. And, and your peers. Yeah. Yeah. I and totally agree. It gives you birth by... <laughs> Well, and that whole concept around um, nurture versus nature, and I honestly believe everything's nurture. Everything is nurture because it can all be altered. So mindset moves, or your mind moves it all. But if your mind is constantly being inundated by things that are falsehoods <laughs> and influences that are, you have to be perfect. You have to be beautiful. You have to send this out in a perfect way. Or if you act this way, you're being a complete bitch. Whatever the case is, this is mindset and it needs yeah. to be shifted. But these are very powerful messages that we keep receiving through society, through a church, through our communities, through our organizations, whatever we're involved in. And Unless exposed you're born to in a cave or raised by wolves. <laughs> <laughs> we should all be what's his name um from jungle book uh Mo mowgli no i don't know whatever the kid's name is <laughs> we should all be him <laughs> grow up with the bare necessities <laughs> right so the thing for me is awareness and mm. many people are unaware of the influences around them right so that's what my my mission is is where awareness it's that's mine too it's to challenge to become aware of these things to challenge the belief systems to be able to move forward because as soon as we realize this belief system that i'm holding is not serving me or or the people around me it's time to change it and you can't do that without awareness absolutely not absolutely not yeah <clears throat> So I guess that's our job. That is our job. Yay to us. <laughs> <laughs> Yay to us. Let's build this awareness and broaden this message on how to be true to you and how to be authentic. Because ultimately, your authentic you makes you this incredible shining light in the world. If you can look in the mirror and actually see yourself, yeah. Yes. So the question is, your book talks all about the archetypes, right? And does it talk about how to become more aware of these things? Because I, like I said, I think beauty has become very much in the forefront. Um, well, I shouldn't say very much, but at least it's been brought up to the surface so that people are a lot more aware of it. Virgin is moving because we have, um, as each generation evolves we are moving further and further away from the concept of get married at 20 or 18 mm -hmm. or whatever and you should be a virgin when you get married and all this mm -hmm. crazy crazy stuff um i think that's kind of starting to transition um or has begun its transition and what do you think about bitch it's funny about the virgin part i'm just reading the uh, <laughs> what's this uh, book here uh, the big bestseller book, uh, was it the, uh, what's it called? It's right in here, but I cannot see it on my phone here. Oh, yeah, the purity myth. The purity method? Myth? Myth. Myth. Have you not okay. uh, heard of the purity myth? No, I haven't you even must, heard of it. Yeah, it's it's all about the, the virginity movement and how powerful it is, especially in the United States. Okay. And it's, it's a book specifically on that topic. And you, Meaning going not, back to virginity? Like it's as in not, hold off and abstain? Absolutely. Right. And it's not as, it's not in shrinkage if you read this book. Oh, really? Yes. It is, <laughs> it is a major, major movement. Movement. Absolutely. I mentioned a, a little bit in my book, her, she, that's what she focuses on in that book. Yep. I would, I would definitely recommend it absolutely 100%. Interesting. <laughs> I would not have thought. I, obviously, yeah. or I wouldn't have stated that, but I, that's surprising. I mean, I can understand abstinence from a space of 
Um, I need to love you. This needs to be something not just cheaply given. Do you know what I mean? Like where it's a mutually respecting um, relationship. I understand that 100%. I cannot understand the concept of, um, I, I just can't understand the concept of holding off until what? What is, what is, what's the marker? What, holding off for the man? Would, is he supposed you? to hold off too? No, he's not supposed to hold off. Too. <laughs> That's the double standard. He's supposed to come into the room very well experienced in initiating you into the fine art of lovemaking. That's his job. Oh my God. Right? <laughs> God help this world. <laughs> <laughs> It's the craziest oh. double standard there is. However, it serves a purpose. And that purpose would be? Basically, if you, if, you, if you look at men and women, women know that they are the parent of a child. A man does not. Unless he procreates with a virgin, right. then he knows 100% that it's his child. To take back that power we invented virginity. Oh my God. So you hold it until the moment of marriage for that one man. That's the whole idea behind virginity. Okay. Do you want to hear something really funny? <laughs> so in the sex series, we talked about girls. So teenagers holding off, but still having like other ways yeah. to like, so yeah. anal sex has become yeah, okay. like really big yeah. for, for teenagers. Yes. Oh, for yes. teenagers, because then they can't get pregnant. Yes. And I'm still technically a virgin. Absolutely. Oral sex and the anal sex, uh, those are fine. It's, it's about the hymen, which is a myth in itself. Right. However, that is the, that is a standard. That is, <laughs> that is so crazy to me. I'm so glad I have well, actually, if I had girls, I wouldn't be teaching them that. I'd be teaching them that they should love themselves and love their bodies, <laughs> not that they should hold off and abstain for some mythical guy that's going to, what, be hit. Again, this perpetuates that stupid idea of, this is my prince and he's come to save me. <laughs> what? Well, in, in part of my Where's book, the I empowerment about, in that? I talk about a lot of this movement was first initiated by spiritual influence however spiritual or religious yeah religious let's okay put it, let's put it as it is okay however there was there came a time when church and state and church and the bedroom were separated so right that did not have the kind of influence the influence was then taken up by um fairy tales right which is exactly what you're talking about. Tell them from when they're little, little <laughs> girls that this is what they should want because this is what we should get. But that's never what they got. They never got this happy ending story. I shouldn't say never. There's, there are cases where people have found some of the most incredible loves, but those are far and few between. Yeah. If we don't love ourselves, we can't give that kind of love and we certainly can't receive that kind of love. But that's not what we want the young girls to learn. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I, but I think it's interesting because you're seeing more and more like, okay, so frozen was not about, you mm -hmm. know, come ride in on your horse and save me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's become a hugely, well, I think frozen two just came out. I don't know where yeah, it's coming, coming out. out yeah. um, hugely empowering uh, movement. And it was really funny. I remember watching, how old was I? I think it was when the boys, it must have been when the boys were really young. Um, we watched Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And I seriously was like, oh my God, what kind of woman is this? This is horrible. <laughs> because the mentality is just so crazy. But it's absolutely, absolutely true to the time that the story came out, right? Mm -hmm. Women thought like this and women mm -hmm. acted like this. And, and they would be these almost overbearing in certain ways, but then completely submissive in other ways. And the, it wasn't an owning of inner power at all. It was mm -hmm. just, I don't know, just so weird. <laughs> so weird. I don't believe that a lot of people look at um, fairy tales in that way. However, yeah, they carry that message. 
I absolutely did. Yeah. Absolutely did. And it, it's nice to see um, stories coming forward today that are more about owning you, right? And that's one of the things like I, I really appreciated Frozen when we watched it for that reason. It was about owning you and not needing someone external to find you mm -hmm. and to love you and accept you for who you are, even with all of your flaws. Yeah. The script is changing. However, the damage has been done for the most part. So now it has to be undone. So it's like picking up the pieces. <laughs> putting them back together again. And Thank you, Humpty back Dumpty, together. for that analogy. But you got to think, like from a Ming vase or a Ming vase um, perspective, that that can create some of the most beautiful art that we see today is those mm -hmm. vases that were broken and then put back together and create these incredibly intricate, beautiful lines that make it so unique. However, to appreciate that truly, fully, completely in human beings, we have to change our values. Mm -hmm. What values are we teaching? And it's funny because today we look at our society and what are we teaching? There, there's a lot of talk around our value systems have been um, eroded. And I think the value systems are shifting. And some of the value systems are still, the erosion is some of the old that needs to leave. That really isn't about really isn't about the person it's again driven more by the masculine or or the old premise of men rule women are here to serve them um and some of that's leaving and there's a lot of empowerment but it's coming through in weird ways because it's not being taught properly mm -hmm. at least there you can see there's a shift which is good we mm -hmm. have not perfected the shift <laughs> it will take a long time to perfect that shift. Oh, evolution. And do we want do we want the institution to dictate that shift? Because the, the institution is why we are where we are. Right. Who is going to initiate? Who is going to bring the right message of that shift? Well, the institution in that case would have been religion for a long time, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's that's my world. That's where I grew up. I grew up <laughs> pretty much from a baby until my mid twenties in the pews of a church. So I'm very, very familiar with that institution and its teachings. Right. And there are a lot of values there that absolutely I do hold hard and fast to my soul. However, the execution, I was not always so uh, incongruent, you know, totally cool with. Right. It's so funny because my kids and I were talking about religion and what's in the Bible. And I said, there's some really fascinating things that have been stated in the Bible that I wonder um, very much on the interpretation of what was said. And we're talking about like the one scene, I haven't read the Bible since I was, I don't know, in my teens. It's been a very long time. I think it's maybe time for me to pick up that book again for the simple reason that there are some really incredible stories. So the one with the woman and the baby, the, the two women and the baby. Yeah. Was that King Solomon? Like that? And they were going to cut the baby in half, right? Yeah. King Solomon. So this is the story truly of ego love versus pure love. Yeah. Ego love says, cut that baby in half because I own it. I want it. It's mine. Pure or love. that you can't have it. Or that you can't have it. <laughs> yeah. If I can't have it, you can't have it. <laughs> or the other side, which is pure love that says, I love you no matter what, and I will give you whatever you need. And if that means I don't get you, if that means I can't, I, like I don't experience this, then I'm going to give you what you need. That's pure love. That's unconditional love. And that's what that story dictates. I don't know how the Bible exactly explains that um, or what what representation that story offered in the Bible. I'm going to have to go back and read it. <laughs> I am going to have to go back and read the Bible, because, but I'm going to be like getting mad at the Bible. <laughs> as far as messages of morality, right. messages of humanity. Yes. The Bible is, a, all True. Of the religious texts are tremendous sources of information and knowledge. Right. It is how then it is preached. Right. That becomes 
convoluted and with an agenda sometimes. Well, I find anything that wraps any lesson that is wrapping shame and guilt around it, there's a problem there. That's control. Yes, absolutely, right? And again, that's why I I struggle myself with any religious faction because it is about control and I don't believe that that's what the true lessons of that is teaching you. It's teaching you about you and you being the best you you can possibly be out in the world. And there's so many incredible examples that the Bible describes of people being their absolute best or their absolute worst and how we can rise above that and the things that we can actually do. Yeah, if you can read it from that perspective, however, you're usually being taught. No one reads the Bible cold and gets the messaging. Someone has to usually help you, assist you in the interpretation. But Mm -hmm. what is their motivation for their interpretation? Well, again, I I think back to all the different religions that have stemmed from um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Multiple different religions have stemmed from that, and one is better than the other according to one to the other. (laughs) But why? It's the same. It's the same messages, just interpreted differently and now spoken differently. I have this belief that Someone once said that um, humans are a virus upon the earth. (laughs) (laughs) We bring that mentality into everything we do. Because as human beings, we have have things like egos. We have uh, emotions like jealousy and hate. And that will always influence how we present anything to anyone we can never be pure because we're not pure we're 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 a virus <laughs> we're we're faulted we have we are faulted ego is so interesting though when we recognize it for what it is it's a lot easier to be aware in any situation on choice because every single thing that we do creates choice every single thing that happens in our day creates choice And even when we don't think we have choice, we always have choice. And it's those micro moments of choice that we shine or don't. Our ego is there or we're pure or what space we come from. And I'm constantly looking, looking, saying, thinking to, well, I say this and then there's moments I'm so caught up in my own ego. It's just complete bull. Um, But I'm I'm always assessing. I'm always assessing. What do I want out of this? What do I want to give out of this? How do I want to how do I want to offer this or what do I want to experience from this? I believe that most people don't look at it that way. It's this is what I want. So right. your array of choices are narrowed to one. Infinite possibilities to one. That is so very limited. I don't want to live in that space. (laughs) You have a choice. I do have a choice. I choose not to. (laughs) I choose to live in a space of many, 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 many choices, many, many options. And it's funny because you're 100% right. I want, therefore it is. This is the reality. It's not the reality. It's the reality I'm choosing in this moment. I'm choosing this. And it's a very, it's a very, I don't want to say it's complicated because it isn't, but it absolutely is a complicated um, process to get to understand, to truly get to understand that, that we're always choosing. Well, I'll run this by you. What happens to you when you are a baby, a child, a young Mm -hmm. child, and you want? Usually people around you will give you everything specific thing that you want. (laughs) Okay. So now you're a teenager and you want, you're an adult and you want, it all comes back down to not choices. It is getting what I want. Right. Because I was raised on getting what I want. 
Right. It's ingrained in you now. Yes. And getting what we want, I think, is our natural state, getting what we want. But I think very often we don't really know what we want and we keep asking for the things we don't really want. <laughs> yes, that <laughs> Thinking that's what we want. Time. Yes. <laughs> like it was really funny. My, I was just at my parents for Thanksgiving and uh, they put on Wreck-It Ralph, which is again, another Disney or some sort of movie like that. I don't know if it's Disney, something like it. Um, and he, he wrecks the internet. It's very funny and there's lots of like great little scenes in this kid's movie. But there's this one scene in there where she's, she's in the room with all the Disney princesses. So it's got to be Disney. And they're, they're talking about like this light shines on you and these birds sing and all this music comes on when you're singing in your purpose, right? With what you really want. And she starts singing and she's terrible. <laughs> and then the scene comes up and she has got what she wanted. She said, I want the steering wheel. I got what I wanted. But she's not happy. Because it's not really what she wanted. She thought it was what she wanted. And very often we're so not clear. We are looking at this small little piece of the big picture, thinking that little piece is what we want, not the big picture. And then when you pull yourself out of the little picture, that little piece, and you get to see the bigger picture, you see the what you really want. And you're like, it's the meaning is very different. And then you can seek out. And then you can say yes to. And then you can say no to all the things that don't align with that. But when we're looking at this little piece, we think it's the be all end all. I have to have that job. Why do you have to have that job? What is it about the job? What is it that makes that job special that you really want? Because then you're looking at meaning, not just the, not just the storefront. Well, we're kind of born disadvantaged because we were born physical. Mm, we're not of. born spiritual. We are, ah, but we are, <laughs> but that is not, that is not where we are focused. Ah, We're that's focused so true on our physical. Yes. Because that, that we think that the physical is the only part of us. And then it's our job. Isn't it exciting? It's our job to find our spiritual selves again. Cause that's a connection to us. And then that's when life really opens up and becomes this amazing, powerful movement. <laughs> But there is a trap door to that because you can look for that spiritual and end up being in a religion. Ah, mm. because again, it's being driven by a message that isn't the message. It's not your message. No, that's why I always talk about meditation um, because you're taking it inward. Find you. <laughs> First place to find you is you in not somewhere external. And it doesn't matter how many times you sit in a church. It doesn't how, matter how many times you sit and listen to Tony Robbins. It doesn't matter how many times you listen to the external world. You're never going to find what you seek until you seek you. Never. So meditation is the first space or something that allows you that connection to inside, right? To rise up. It's funny. I was listening to... Um, Deepak Chopra, um, one of his books on my drive back from my parents' place this weekend. And he's talking about the spiritual laws and how to get everything that you want, whatever that may be. doesn't matter physical or not. And it was really interesting because his first statement was, go inward. <laughs> and any of the great leaders talk about go inward, <laughs> right? Even religion, they say, pray and you're going inward. <laughs> but they but in that case you're directing it to a person which isn't really mm -hmm. that's I think that's the one element that kind of gets lost in prayer is you're looking well, at a person you're perceiving on, it to be a person depends on how you've been conditioned to think of god right because god can be internal and god is internal because we all we all are part of it yeah it's funny, I don't look at God from a perspective of a being like that, like at all. Um, but I do see it as being something that we all have inherently in us. But there's no money in that. <laughs> Darn it! Give me your car! Give me your yachts! Give me your house! There is a, there's a guy down in the States. He's a billionaire and he's made his money like this. He's a preacher. It's crazy. He's got his own He's got his own TV station and he says this, give me your cars. <laughs> Repent. <laughs> he 
You're right. Darn it. <laughs> Meditate. Go inwards. Whoops. I mean, take my expensive. meditations. <laughs> So funny. Okay, right. so let's talk about your book. <laughs> well, we sort of have them, but in your book, we talk about the archetypes. You talk about some ways to start recognizing these and becoming more aware. I um, don't give I don't give solutions because I'm not a woman. Right. And I cannot walk in the shoe of a woman comfortably. So all I can really do is give an option to see themselves in a right. different light, in a purer light. Because ultimately, no one can give us solutions. We give ourselves the solutions. We have keys and we have, we have um, key details we need to be able to make those, come up with the creative solutions, which is what you offer. You offer those, you offer those details, those elements, those pieces that allow the awareness to go, oh, I get it. And now this. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So as I started with my story, my story was about the feminine is what it ultimately is. And ultimately, that's what I want to create is a book about that essence. So I've continued past Virgin Beauty Bitch to continue writing on that topic. And it is just blowing my mind to see it in its nakedness what feminine actually is is this is this the book we were talking about that has to do with um adam and eve it's part of it uh because i believe that that is the ultimate fraud really <laughs> <laughs> if i were to put it as it is because to me Eve is Eve was at well. Let's say the whole um, Garden of Eden. Right. It was a men's club. Right. God is a man. Adam is a man. The snake is a man. And then there's poor Eve, <laughs> <laughs> who comes in and tempts him. She's a temptress. Right. However, I believe that is also the space in which women got their soul, and that soul is the feminine. Interesting. Go on. So I, I talk about how that came about and what that might have looked like. Hmm. And, and moving forward from there, what actual feminine actually means. And what, and what do you think it means? And what do you think the feminine really means? We think it's, when we think of feminine, we basically think of biology. We don't really necessarily think beyond that to the psychology of it, to the sociology of it, right. to the spirituality of it. We don't capture all those elements when I say the word feminine to someone. Those elements don't come into focus. It's more, what does feminine look like to our senses, our five senses? <laughs> it's such a conscious it's funny i was literally just talking to somebody about the conscious state and how everything in our conscious state is perceived through our five senses that's it that's how we take in the data and then we have our awesome little ras system sorting it out saying yes no yes no yes no 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 we don't need this yes we need that so it's super limited and it's funny that you say this about the psychology and the sociology and all of the elements of spirit that <laughs> come into this that are not being considered at all <laughs> at all yeah however my i feel my role is to bring this into focus because I, I i believe we're aware of it we're just not conscious of it on a conscious level, level that kind of matches where we think of it as far as the the physical side of it okay so i'm gonna ask a pretty bold little question here yeah. what makes you think that the feminine was why do you think the feminine was squashed the way it was for so long? Because we, as a species, we value one element over all others. We value strength. We do not envision feminine as strength. <laughs> we envision masculine as strength. Because it's brute force. That's where our value is. 
Because if you just take it from the physical mm -hmm. perspective, masculine can subdue feminine. Of if course. You just put two in a ring and let them go at it. The masculine most of the time will win just on right. pure physical ability. That's what we value as a species. But you got to think like from an evolutionary standpoint, that makes sense because, okay, going back a million years ago, what were we? We needed to be able to be very wily. We needed to be quick. We needed to be able to survive things that were attacking us. And which, which of the two genders, well, the female could have been agile and could have been quick-witted. Absolutely. But the masculine could have beat it from a physical standpoint, yes. and maybe that was all that was needed. I don't know. And we, we developed a society where the men went out and hunted as a, as a pack, and right. the women stayed at home and collected whatever was available. Gatherers. So socially, we, we, we had this dynamic that we created. And one was more, because when the men came home, they came home with meat. Right. Right. We get to eat. <laughs> right. The, the women didn't go out and collect meat. The right. men went out and collected meat. And how funny is that? Because other species do. You look at lions, or tigers. Yeah. Females are the ones bringing home the bacon, baby. <laughs> 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 right. But we don't, as human beings, we don't use just our our born faculties, we invent things. Right. And men invented weapons and they invented tools to make their job easier, to give them an advantage. Right. Interesting. Hmm. And that's the legacy that has still exists today. It seems so interesting that we go through massive evolution, really. Like we have evolved as a species, we have incredible frontal cortex or logic centers available to us today, in comparison to back then. But yet, we have a primitive mind hijacking our frontal cortex more often than not in any given day. And we still have these <laughs> ingrained, ridiculous systems that are so outdated. Mm -hmm. Because we don't work in a space of physical brute force anymore. We're more in a logical space on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, what do we really, if you look at our brain, what do we really, what is the pure essence, the purest trigger? It's like we mentioned before, right? Fight, flight, fornicate. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Reproduce. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Continue on the species, right? It's, a, it's right, an yeah. absolutely great yeah. behavior. <laughs> that hasn't changed. Nope. <laughs> it's just gotten more fun. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's true. I mean, we still, we still live by a lot of primitive um, systems in place in a very, <clears throat> in a very different time. In a very different time. Yeah, well, our our external world has changed. Our internal world, not so much. Ah, oh, but the work can be done very easily. <laughs> <laughs> the internal world, yes. The internal world that gifts us so much that we don't understand. <sighs> okay. Your book is coming out when? So the... Ebook version. I'm going to go online on November 4th, and we're going to we're going to jack it up to get ourselves a bestseller on that date. So, um, listeners, pay attention. Go on yes. and buy a book because this to become a bestseller, it's 500 copies, right? Are Are you going Canada, U.S. on Amazon? Um, I have someone looking after the the nitty gritty details. I would prefer yeah, Canada and U.S. all in North America for sure. Okay, so people, when you do this, because we've been through, I've been through this, mm -hmm. um, when you do this, do not buy five books because that only accounts for one book sale with Amazon. The way that they measure these metrics to determine bestseller means per purchase, not mm -hmm. per book. So um, please go and buy one of these books. And as far as um, print copies are concerned, 
I'm going to start a campaign, not a campaign, a promotion, let's say, on um, social media, yep. where I have 50 copies that I've had printed, and the first uh, 50 people to um, order them from me, and I have to work out the details as to how to get that link uh, sorted out, but it'll be on my social media. Um, the first 50 yep. people, I will sign and uh, send uh, a signed copy to them. That's awesome. And what is your what is your handle on and which which platform are you going to be using? Instagram Probably all and of them. Facebook typically are the ones that I'm most attracted to, and it's just Virgin Beauty Bitch, just my, the the podcast and the okay. title of the book. Excellent. To find us, to find me. I say us because the podcast I do with a partner, Heather Erlen. <laughs> But the book was just something that um, was inspired in me that I felt would be a good piece to add to what we were doing on the podcast. Also, I don't know, after many talks with you, it was also something that had to come out. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. it's, it's funny when a book starts with someone and the idea won't leave you alone. <laughs> it, it basically stalks you. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't fight those so much. Uh, it takes me a while to answer the call sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I had a book that did that with me. It stalked me. I was like, all right, all right, I'll write you. <laughs> Goodness gracious. I need to be born. Come on. <laughs> I need you to leave my head space because you're like crazy. <laughs> yeah. So funny. Um, okay. So if you want to reach Chris... You can reach him at Virgin Beauty Bitch. You can on Facebook, on Instagram. If um, you want to get his book, absolutely. November 4th, Amazon.ca and Amazon.com. Purchase from either of those spaces. Uh, you will not regret it. Chris is a beautiful writer. But you can tell by the way he articulates his, <laughs> his words. He uses his words very well. What like would I you said, like? it's it was a it was a it wasn't the path I chose. It chose me. <laughs> I find that often. Yeah. <laughs> and then it takes you on a ride, yes. and you're on the freight train. You yes. become the freight train, really. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yes. As long it's as fantastic. it's sort of sort of downhill, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the freight train doesn't matter. It'll just push through anything. <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> we'll push through anything. Is there anything else you want to leave the audience with? You know what, the, the message is become aware of what your influences are. Like, why do you believe what you believe? Why are you, why are some things in your life so important that they guide you and you don't guide them? Ah, oh, that's such a beautiful question. What is guiding you instead of you guiding it? Because this, I talk about tools often and whether the tool is using us or whether we're using the tool, right? And I think your brain, your beautiful mind is an incredible tool that often we allow to run around like an untrained puppy. (laughs) It's doing whatever it wants and jumping on people and (laughs) yes, and peeing on them and (laughs) running out into the street. So that's our minds. Um, (laughs) And I think that we can have very beautifully well-used, well-honed tools. And once you have them, again, life opens up, right? And I know that that's your mission is to open people up to the beauty of who they really are. Absolutely. Not the the physical archetype. Absolutely. Yes. I'm I'm an advocate of sort, I guess, for, for women. However, my major goal is humanity. I hear you. It's not about male or female. It's about all of us. And this is why I love you. (laughs) We carry a very common goal. Carry a very common goal. Actually, so I should say this before we go. Chris and I are part of a mastermind group that is phenomenal people. I I have to admit and give it up to the woman that started that whole mastermind. Her name is Christine, Christina Marlette. And you are going to hear from her actually in the upcoming podcast. But um, she's an incredible person and all, 
all the people that she's brought together, though, incredible souls doing incredible work. I'm so grateful that she's kind of created this space for us to all incubate <laughs> and evolve in that space to really go out and do something powerful. I, I'm, I'm so appreciative of her, but I'm so appreciative of our group. Hail, hail. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how to follow that. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, Thank you Chris, very much for for this opportunity. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, sharing thoughts, and sharing ideals, and moving the needle just a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further until we see the fruits of our labor. <laughs> I don't even know if we will see those fruits necessarily. However, as long as they fruit. I think we will see those fruits. <laughs> I definitely think we will see those fruits and taste those fruits <laughs> and share those fruits. <laughs> and on that note, um, I will leave details for Chris um, inside the podcast notes. So if you're looking to reach out to Christopher, you are more than welcome. Yes, absolutely. And thank you. And that concludes this week's episode with Christopher Kennedy. We here at Fear It Goes want to give you every available tool and we want you to be able to really question and ponder and think about the things that really matter in your life and the things that hold you in positions that you don't want to be in. Archetypes and today's discussion is just one of many areas that we need to question and say, does this really work for me? Does this really allow me to be the best person that I can be? Does this really allow me to come out and be the best person I can be in the world? So until next week, my beautiful souls have an absolutely extraordinary week.